Society for Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is essential to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Um, we really appreciate you coming out and uh, taking your time on this uh, awesome fall afternoon. Uh, we only get so many of these in Florida. Um, today our speaker is Dr. Randall Holcomb. He is the Dave Moore Professor of Economics at Florida State University. Um, he does a lot of work with um, public choice economics and uh, he wrote a book, From Liberty to Democracy, uh, The Transformation of the American Government. Um, and he's going to be speaking to us today about uh, the way that elections have changed from the way they were written in the Constitution to the way they are now. Um, some of it has been through constitutional amendments, some of it has just been through practice. Um, so without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Randall Holman. Thank you very much, Alex. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, uh, you know, an election's coming up tomorrow. <laughs> Some of you are aware of this. Uh, and one of the things I always hear around election time is how you need to go out and vote. It's your patriotic duty to go and vote. And uh, I'm not sure why that ought to be the case because a lot of people don't even know what's on the ballot. They don't even know what they're voting for. I guess most people probably be aware of the presidential candidates, but when you get further down from that, it becomes uh, iffier and iffier. One thing I like to do in uh, my classes uh, every four years when there is a, a presidential election is to give a pop quiz to my undergraduate students. Now, of course, my students, being college students, they're among the most well-informed of the American public. But uh, I gave them a quiz, I had a class that had 63 students in. I gave them a quiz, and uh, I asked them several questions. Among those questions, I asked them, tell me, who are your US senators that represent you in, in the Senate? Just tell me the names of your senators. <coughs> tell me the name of your representative in the House of Representatives. And then I asked, are any of them up for election this November? Uh, and if so, name the people who they're running against. Wasn't asking anything about policy. Uh, what, what are their policies? You know, what do they think of this or that? Uh, so I have 63 students. Uh, and I asked them uh, those questions. Two of the 63 students actually could name both of their senators and their representative and whether they're up for re-election and if so, who they're running against. Two out of 63. Uh, and I'm sure you law students would do better. Um, but, uh, you know, these are college students among the, the best informed of, of people in the general public. By the way, I also asked him uh, who the football coach is at Florida State and the basketball coach. Uh, and I like to do that to compare, you know, people, some people are informed about politics because it's interesting. Uh, some people are more informed about sports. I was actually kind of surprised, most people could name Jimbo Fisher uh, as the football coach, but I was kind of surprised us and half the students knew Leonard Hamilton was our basketball coach. Um, but still more than the number of students who can name who is up for election. And this is in the, in the U.S. House and Senate, right? I mean, this, we're not talking about the lesser races. We're not talking about the constitutional amendment. Uh, that probably a lot of people show up, they won't even know they're on the ballot until they get there, and they'll try to read the ballot summaries, which... Um, so why, I mean, you know, why are we encouraging people to vote? who don't even know what they're voting on. Now, if I'm talking like this, it sounds anti-democratic and maybe even anti-American. Well, you know, it's anti-American to be talking against democracy. But if you go back to when this country was poor, uh, 
The, the founding fathers designed our constitutional system of government deliberately to insulate the government from democracy, to insulate the government from popular opinion. If you were to go back in 1776, just grab somebody off the street and ask them, tell me in one word, what's the underlying principle of American government? In 1776, that word would have been liberty. That we're forming a new government to protect our, our liberty. If you were to grab somebody off the street today and ask them, tell me in one word, what's the, the fundamental principle of American government? That answer would overwhelmingly be democracy. We're a democracy. And what people mean by democracy is government ought to do what most people want. Uh, that's what you hear uh, in policy debates. Uh, I guess we did have a Supreme Court case on uh, Obama. I think it's okay to call it that because President Obama said he liked the term. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in, in all of the, all of the debates uh, about it, outside of what goes on in the courtroom, uh, people are talking about, well, most people are in favor of it, or no, most people are against it, most people want this. That, but that's antithetical to the way that our founding fathers designed the government originally. If you look at our Constitution, the federal government was designed to be one-sixth democratic. We talk about our system of checks and balances. We have three branches of government that are checking and balancing each other. <coughs> and for that to work, if these branches of government actually can check and balance each other, they ought to be roughly equal power. And so if you look at our three branches of government, you look at the legislative branch, there's where the democracy comes in. Uh, members of the House of Representatives are uh, voted on by popular vote. The way the Constitution was originally written, senators were chosen by their state legislatures. And that was true until 1913, when the 17th Amendment to the Constitution was. The 17th Amendment allows for direct election of senators, but before that, for most of American history, senators were chosen by their state legislatures. And there's a certain logic to that, because if legislation has to go through the House and the Senate, then there's a little bit more of a stringent test because in the House of Representatives, legislation has to meet with the approval of the representatives of the people. And in the Senate, legislation had to meet with the approval of the representatives of the state government. So unless both the representatives of the state governments approved and the representatives of the people, that was a that was the bar the legislation had to meet. Now, with direct election of senators, the bar is a lot lower because both the House and the Senate are representatives of the people. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, uh, I, I mentioned Obamacare, but I wonder if that could have passed the Senate under the old regime because one of the things Obamacare does is put an additional cost burden on the states in the form of uh, more eligibility for Medicaid. Uh, it may well be that representatives of the state governments would not approve that the same way that, uh, that uh, representatives of people do. Okay, so, so we've got the legislative branch of government uh, that's uh, the representatives of the people, the de democratic part of government in the House of Representatives, representatives of the state governments in the Senate. Uh, the uh, judicial branch, uh, judges are appointed. Uh, the, appointed by the president, but uh, they're insulated from democratic pressures by their uh, appointment. Uh, and in the executive branch, you read the Constitution, the president is chosen by the Electoral College. Uh, and actually, it may well be the House of Representatives, but let's back up and let, let's look at the Constitution and see the way that the Constitution designed the president to be elected. That uh, the Electoral College, you know, has uh, each state is represented in the Electoral College by, um, they get the number of electors that are equal to the number of representatives in the House of Representatives plus the number of senators. 
So we add the representatives and senators together for each state. Uh, those, uh, that's the number of electors that each state gets. The Constitution says that the electors are chosen by the states. And the Constitution never has said how the states choose their electors. It's up to the states to choose their electors. But the Constitution doesn't say now, and never has said how the states choose their electors. You go back to the election of 1800, when Thomas Jefferson was elected, the most common method of choosing electors was to have the state legislatures do it. Uh, and uh, and that, that phased out pretty quickly. Actually, one state, South Carolina, they didn't have a popular vote for president until after the war between the states. Uh, but, uh, but originally, the Constitution never has said how the electors are chosen. Uh, and that pretty quickly went, by the time we get into the 1820s, most states were doing it by, by popular vote. So the system we have today was pretty much in, in place by the time we get to the 1820s. But why do we have this electoral college? Why do we have that system? The founders thought that uh, uh, most people wouldn't be that well informed to know about the various candidates, but also they wanted to insulate the choice of the chief executive from democratic opinion, from popular opinion. So rather than have the people choose the president, where now the president is uh, accountable to popular opinion, the electors would vote for the president. Uh, and the idea was that the electors would be people who would be better informed about presidential candidates than the general public. So we select a group of electors who are better informed, who know more about the candidates, and those electors then cast their votes for president. Another provision in the Constitution is that the electors cast their votes in their states. The Constitution says the electors cast their votes for president in their states. Now, why would the Constitution say that? Uh, well, I mean, one thing you might think of, I don't think is correct, um, is travel was more difficult back then, and so for all of them to get together and meet would have been a burden, but then you wouldn't have to specify electors cast their votes uh, in those states. And after all, the legislature all got together to meet in one place if that was something important. In fact, it looks like the founders thought it was important to specify that the electors cast their votes in their states. And they did that to prevent collusion among the electors so that the electors might get together and say, you know, well, I'll vote for your candidate, you vote for my So sort of prevent law growing and prevent collusion among the electors. So the electors, the Constitution specifies specifically the electors don't all get together to cast their votes. The founders thought that most commonly, electors would cast a vote for a favorite son candidate for a candidate that was from their state. Uh, the, uh, and the, the Constitution was originally written, uh, electors cast votes for two candidates. Uh, and it specified one, at least one of which had to be from a state other than the uh, electors of state. And what the founders thought was most electors would probably cast a vote for a favorite son candidate from their state. And so in the typical election, Nobody would get an electoral majority. And the Constitution says if nobody gets an electoral majority, then it goes to the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives chooses among the top candidates. Uh, as originally written, the Constitution says the top five candidates, um, as amended, is now the top three candidates. But the Constitution uh, uh, specifies that if nobody gets an electoral majority, which is what the founders thought would typically be the case, 
then the selection, the, the top candidates go to the House of Representatives, and the House of Representatives chooses the president. So the Electoral College was really like a search committee. We'd get together a bunch of people who would be well informed about the candidates, and that search committee then would cast their vote for people who they believed would make uh, a good choice for president. And then because the founders thought mostly, uh, typically, nobody would get a majority of the electoral votes, then it would be up to the House of Representatives to choose the president. So the search committee gives us the candidates, the House of Representatives, and picks among the top candidates. The system never worked that way. Uh, that uh, you look at, at our early history, and it's a history of <coughs> candidates who all won electoral majorities. Uh, and so as a result, the House of Representatives had very little to do uh, as far as selecting the president because the candidates won by uh, electoral majority. So we had a pretty quick evolution from the way the founders envisioned the system into a system that's a lot like the system we have today because not only was it did uh, the, can the presidential candidates get an electoral majority, but also the states pretty quickly moved to popular voting for electors. So by the time we get into the 1820s, uh, not all states were having popular voting for electors, but most states did. And because uh, in election after election, uh, the, uh, the winning candidates uh, ended up winning the electoral majority. Uh, you know, people thought of it as uh, whoever gets the most votes ends up uh, uh, winning the election. We should put this clock on the other uh, wall. Here. <coughs> I don't want to run too much over time. So, uh, okay, so the system, uh, so the system really didn't, didn't work the way the founders in, envisioned it, uh, and. Um, a, a kind of a watershed event in American politics was the election of 1824. In the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson got the highest number of electoral votes, but he didn't get a majority. And so as a result, the top three candidates' names were forwarded to the House of Representatives for the House of Representatives to choose the president. And uh, even though Andrew Jackson got an electoral majority, I'm uh, sorry, got uh, uh, the most electoral votes. He didn't have a majority. The House of Representatives ended up choosing one of their own, John Quincy Adams. And if you remember back to your American history a little bit, um, this election, uh, the critics of this election, in particular supporters of Andrew Jackson, called this a corrupt bargain. Because Henry Clay was the third candidate. And Henry Clay said he would throw his support behind John Quincy Adams in exchange for being appointed Secretary of State. That's what happened. Corrupt bargain? Actually, there was no indication that he agreed to that beforehand. There was no there was no proof proved in that election. But what did the supporters of Jackson have to say? They intended that. Okay. So, and was it a corrupt bargain? If, if the supporters of Jackson were right. What's corrupt about that? The Constitution says if nobody gets an electoral majority, the House chooses the president. So let's say the accusation is correct. Is that a corrupt bargain? No, the House is just doing what the Constitution specified. The Jackson supporters said, Jackson got the most electoral votes. He's the one that we should choose. But the Constitution explicitly says if nobody gets a majority, it's up to the House. Where is the corrupt bargain in that? And it may not have even happened. But if it did happen, still, that's, what, that's how the Constitution said that this was supposed to work. And that's the origin of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was then formed for the explicit purpose of electing Andrew Jackson president. They said, this is not going to happen to us again. We're going to make sure that when the next election comes around, Andrew Jackson gets a majority of the electoral votes, so he'll be president. Indeed, that's what happened. That the Democratic Party was organized specifically to elect 
Andrew Jackson president, and it worked. And so uh, Andrew Jackson was elected in 1848. So um, now, uh, you know, stepping back and thinking about this idea of democracy, uh, I go through the, that uh, the, those episodes in American history to suggest to you, you know, now if you uh, anything you say that's anti-democratic, it, it sounds un-American. You know <laughs> that uh, hey, we're a democracy, we support democracy around the world. But you look at the way our country was founded, and the founding fathers deliberately designed our government to insulate it from democratic pressures, to insulate it from popular opinion. When the Constitution set up a government of specified enumerated powers, and the people in government were supposed to carry out the, those, uh, those enumerated powers. Uh, and, they, and in so doing, they were, they were, the government was designed to insulate the government from popular opinion, insulate them from democratic pressures. The, the U.S. government was, was designed to be one-sixth democratic. <coughs> and if you, if you look at American history from, from the start, um, and even, uh, we can go back before the Constitution, uh, because um, a lot of times the Constitution is advertised as a document that limits the powers of government and guarantees the rights of people. Uh, and I think that's a mischaracterization. The reason why is that at the time we approved our Constitution, we already had a Constitution. The Articles of Confederation, our first Constitution. The United States government was already operating under a Constitution. And when you look at the difference between the existing Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and the new Constitution, the new Constitution actually expanded the powers of government, didn't limit them. So thinking about the Constitution as a document that limits the powers of government, I think that's wrong. Because we already had a Constitution that limited the powers of government even more. So by passing our Constitution, we expanded the powers of government. We didn't, we didn't win. And I'll just throw this out. This may be good for law students. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that our Constitution actually was, uh, was legitimately uh, approved. See, because we already had a Constitution, which was the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation said in it that it could be amended by the unanimous approval of the states. So we had a constitution, the states were united under our constitution, the Articles of Confederation. And that constitution specified by unanimous approval of the states it could be amended. So then you look at the U.S. Constitution. And it says that it will take effect when nine of the 13 states agree. But we already had a constitution that said in order to change the constitution we had, you needed unanimous approval. Now, it's true, eventually all 13 of the states agree, but that's far different from saying all 13 have to agree in order for the change to take effect, right? Because after nine agree, essentially they're, you know, uh, uh, leaving the other three uh, left to hang unless they, they go along with them. I mean, I guess all the states would, they would have been interested if one of the states maybe decided they didn't want to join. That state would be, anything. but, uh, but, you know, I'll just, I'll just ask you law students. I mean, here we have a constitution that says it requires unanimous approval to be amended. And then the new document says, after nine of the 13 states agree, the new constitution takes effect. Is that, is that legitimate? I read one theory, and this would be a big burn in the side of Abraham Lincoln, but it basically said that it was when the states were ratifying the constitution, they were ineffectively seceding from the United States. 
United States is ceding from the old Constitution, which some would say they have the right to under Article 2, which says that each state retains its sovereignty and independence. Therefore, it seceded from the union created by the Articles of Confederation and us ceded to a new one created by the Constitution and that any state that didn't ratify it was simply an independent nation until it agreed to accede to the new union, right? And also read that the whole nine-state thing was a dirty trick played by the Federalists to try to get all 13 states to get in since if they could just get nine to ratify, the other four would just feel bound by fraternity and patriotism to go along with it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. The, the, I think what I've heard on this from constitutional scholars, but you people know more about this than I do here in the law school, but I think what I've heard on this is that uh, the way the Constitution was ratified was that there, there were conventions that were held in each state, and so it was because of these constitutional conventions that did go through the state legislatures, but rather they had constitutional conventions that approved the new constitution, but still uh, kind of an inter interesting thing. But the, but if you look at the history of American government, you know we started out in 1776 from this idea of preserving our liberty to the idea that we have now that American government, the, the role of, of government is uh, to further the will of the majority through democracy. Yeah. And if you uh, if you fast forward through the rest of American history, and you can see, uh, you know, you get to, to the war between the states, and here's another case where, uh, actually before the war between the states, the, the United States was a plural term. So people would refer to it in the plural. So the United States are going to do this, the United States are going to do that. Uh, and after the war between the states, it became a singular term. So now we say the United States is the most powerful nation in the history of the world, singular rather than, than plural. Um, but uh, there was a, a presumption that we know among many uh, that uh, secession was allowed. Uh, and the secession movement, it actually came not only from the South, but there were people in the North who were interested in the secession. Uh, people in the anti-slavery movement that they felt that, um, that the only way that slavery could be preserved in the South was, because, was due to the, uh, uh, the future slave laws that required that the slaves be returned, and that uh, if they didn't have that obligation, uh, that that would end the institution of slavery in the South. Uh, and so some people in the North were in, in favor of secession. Um, and, and it appears to me and again, maybe I should defer to you, uh, you law students, because you know the law better than I do. But it appears to me secession is entirely constitutional according to the United States Constitution. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the only place where it's addressed in the Constitution, it's allowed. Uh, and I was just talking about the place where it's addressed, which is where it says, uh, the Constitution takes effect among those states that agree when nine of the 13 states agree. So any state at that point, if nine of them agreed and, and you know, one or two or more didn't, then those states, the Constitution says, they can secede from the Union. And it's not addressed any other place. And then the 10th Amendment to, uh, to the Constitution says that the powers not given to the federal government and the Constitution are reserved to the states or to the people. So from my reading of the Constitution, again, I should defer to you as legal scholars here, but my reading is secession is constitutional. Uh, but that was settled by a war, and so now we know <laughs> secession is, uh, it is not, uh, it is not constitutional. The court packed with Lincoln appointee, and he was, of course, going to appoint people that agreed with his law. Well, the Supreme Court decision. Well, but if the South had seceded, then the Supreme Court decision wouldn't apply to the new nation. War between the states would be called the war. You said war, that's a cannabis and a court decision. It's a combination. Yeah, the South was all back in. Yeah. So, um, uh, and then and, uh, this movement toward democracy really picks up steam at the end of the 1800s uh, with the progressive movement. Uh, 
uh, during the progressive era, there was really a change in ideology in, uh, in the thinking about government. That, uh, that before the progressive era, which probably starts sometime around the end of the 1800s on into the beginning of the 20th century, people thought that the role of government was to protect individuals' rights. And the progressive movement brought with it the idea that not only should the government protect individual rights, it should also be looking out for people's economic well-being. And so you have a whole host of laws and agencies and so forth. First, the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, uh, the uh, Pure Food and Drug Act in, in uh, 1906, uh, but a lot of other movement toward more and more uh, government oversight over the economy so that the, the ideology had changed so that not only was government protecting individuals' rights, it was also looking after their economic well-being. This progressive ideology uh, has, uh, has uh, continued uh, to grow throughout the 20th century. Uh, and uh, when you look at the growth of government, a lot of the growth of government came during periods of crisis. That uh, um, if, if you look at federal government spending before and after the war between the states, front or double. After which it stayed pretty level uh, up until, actually up until 1913 when we got the income tax. It's interesting here, I mean, you might think government spending always increases, uh, but uh, from the period from about 1870 on up into the early 1900s, um, real per capita government spending, government spending per person, stayed about level for that whole period as um, income was growing. So federal spending as a share of income that was declining uh, over that period of time uh, until the uh, 16th Amendment uh, allowed the federal income tax. Uh, and so there's, you know, there might be a tendency for you to think that, well, it's because of the income tax that government grew so much. Uh, and I think that's not exactly wrong to think that way. But on the other hand, the income tax had to be pretty popular to pass. Because for a constitutional amendment to pass, it's got to meet the approval of two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, and three-quarters of the states. Uh, and, it, and it met that bar. Uh, so, you know, it's a, an expression, you know, people want bigger government. Uh, then we had uh, a period of, uh, you look at the First World War, again, a big rationing up in government expenditures, government never fell to its uh, to its pre-war level. Uh, then you get into the 1930s, uh, the Great Depression. We had a big expansion in government expenditures that we uh, a lot of times associate with President Roosevelt. And I think that's not exactly wrong, but it's interesting if you look at federal government expenditures, the percentage increase in federal government expenditures. Federal expenditures actually increased by a greater percentage in the four years that Herbert Hoover was president than in the next eight years of Roosevelt until World War II started. So there's actually a big increase in government expenditures. Now we're talking about percentage increase, so Roosevelt is starting from a higher base. But from uh, 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 throughout uh, Hoover's administration, big increase in government expenditures. We know about the, uh, all the New Deal programs, uh, a lot of which are remaining uh, today. And so government increasingly is looking out for people's economic well-being, that progressive ideology uh, takes hold, and we're in a situation where, um, uh, you know, again, government policy is dictated by whatever most people want, rather than by a government that's, uh, uh, that's insulated from democratic pressures. And you would think, I mean, I, uh, again, you people are the, are the legal scholars, but if you read, if you read the Constitution of enumerated powers, and you look at the Tenth Amendment that reserved any powers not enumerated in the Constitution to the states or to the people, just as an ordinary layperson, it seems to me most of what the federal government's doing these days isn't in the enumerated.
separating powers of the Constitution. Uh, but that occurs because we have this democratic mindset. And I, ultimately, I think the triumph of democracy in the United States was in the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson. If you look at big increases in government, if we're looking at expenditures or programs and so forth, throughout <coughs> American history, a lot of those big increases came during times of crisis. And so people are saying, hey, we're, uh, we've got a problem here, the government needs to do something during, during wars, uh, during the Great Depression. And the interesting thing about the Great Society programs is that we weren't in a time of crisis. That um, you look at the war on poverty uh, that was started, which interestingly enough, the you know, poverty rate today is higher than it was when we started the war on poverty. But you look at the war on, on poverty, and, and prior, it, it, the pop, good poverty statistics in the United States weren't kept until uh, after World War II, but you look at the poverty rate in the United States and it continued down until we declared a war on poverty, which we let level up. Uh, but, my, but my point is that we didn't have a crisis. We didn't have more people going into poverty. Actually, fewer people. We had a reduction in the poverty rate. Uh, you look at uh, the big health care programs, Medicare and Medicaid, but we weren't having a health care crisis. Actually, health care was getting better and better. It was getting more and more available. But yet these programs were passed. So ultimately, those great society programs strike me as the triumph of democracy in that when you look earlier in American history, a lot of the growth of government came in response to crises, in response to problems. But the great society programs were addressing areas where actually things were improving, health care, poverty, things were getting better, and yet we put these programs into place. Why? Because most people wanted them, most people were in favor of them. And so uh, I think I'll, I'll uh, close with that, and I would be happy to open up the floor to questions, any questions or comments. I was in South Carolina not switching to a popular vote to offer war between the states. Was that forced upon you by reconstruction? No. Um, they, I mean, they would have had a chance to switch all the way up to 1860. Uh, and I don't remember the year when popular voting took place, but I think it was shortly after, I might have been the election of 1868. I don't really remember the year, but no, it was not forced by reconstruction. I can't believe there's silence a bunch of monsters. Um, you said liberty was the watchword when the establishment of the Constitution back in, uh, in that era, but what about in the preamble where you had the states basically to promote general welfare, provide for the common defense, and also the federal papers themselves, which mentioned uh, energy and exec in the executive energy and branches of government, and also the, the McCullough decision which said, you know, let me as be legitimate. What, how do you respond to this notion that liberty was the watchword? We, maybe it was more like the notion of a Republican type of government. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, the, the Constitution has enumerated powers that it lists and then reserves in the Tenth Amendment any powers not enumerated to the states or to the people. Uh, the General Welfare Clause is an interesting clause in the Constitution, which I, I just feel has to be interpreted differently from the federal government can do anything they feel is in the General Welfare because there's no point in having enumerated powers if you say, well, you can do this, and you can do this, you can do this. Oh, and anything that you think is in the general welfare. My interpretation of that is that what they meant was not targeting benefits to specific individuals or, or groups. So it had to be for the general welfare, not for the specific benefit of a particular individual. Now, um, I don't know if this is exactly a test of my proposition, but when the Confederate states declared independence, they had a chance to write it. They, they did write the Constitution for the Confederate states. And it's very interesting because the, the Constitution of the Confederate States of America is almost identical, word for word, section for section, with the U.S. Constitution. So uh, you know, apparently they liked the U.S. Constitution, and there were only a few areas in which it was changed. Uh, and I would say a minor area would have to do with slavery because the U.S. Constitution allowed it. Uh, but um, the biggest change.
issues if you if you compare, and it's really easy to compare them side by side because the wording is identical, except where they change the words, the sections are identical, the wording is identical. The biggest changes are changes that prevent the federal government from providing targeted benefits to specific individuals or groups. Uh, and they left out the term general welfare uh, in, in, their, in their preamble. Also, if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, um, the Declaration of Independence mainly is a list of grievances against the King of England. You know, so it's like uh, the, the King of England is taking away our rights in these various uh, areas. And so we have a right to overthrow our, our government. I think that idea really goes back to John Locke. Uh, and, and his idea about the role of government to protect individual rights. And if the government's not doing that, if the government's violating your rights, you have a, uh, you have a right to replace your government. Yes. I had two comments. First, you know, the preamble. Well, the preamble was more a list of goals that the Constitution set out to establish by the other articles. And then two, on the general welfare clause, James Madison actually offered a pretty good explanation for general welfare in the context of Article 1, Section 8. He said that it was more a tag on to Congress's power to tax. When Congress lays taxes, it has to be for one of three purposes, either to pay a debt of the federal government, to provide for the common defense of general welfare, and then Congress actually goes about providing for the common defense of general welfare by following all the other enumerated powers. Because if you look at the enumerated powers of Article 1, Section 8, they're either A, related to common defense, declaring war, raising an army, providing and maintaining a navy, or to general welfare, coining money, punishing counterfeiters, regulating commerce between the states with foreign nations and the Indian tribes, so on. I need to get you up here to be my partner because you get better answers than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you hear a lot say about the uh, special interest in politics and there's corruption, there's all the show, like special privileges and um, you know, corporations and whatever. Did that happen a lot in the founding of this country? Um, in other words, does democracy make it more likely that politicians would be corrupt or serve as special interests? I think a lot of that has to do with the, with the size of government. But the bigger government is, the more there is for special interests to go after. But that said, um, special interests have been a feature of the U.S. government since its founding. Um, when you, before, if you, uh, back in the 1800s, uh, the biggest, if you look at the, the federal system that we have, Local governments were far the biggest government by spending. Local governments spent more than the state and federal government combined by a pretty good margin. And so you had the special interests that were involved in local government politics. Um, indeed, um, you know, if we were talking 100 years ago about the growth of government, we'd be talking about the growth of local governments, not the growth of the federal government. But you did have special interests and uh, activity. Uh, one of the big special interest activities from the 1850s was uh, had to do with the post office. Uh, you know, that was something that specified in the Constitution. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, Postal Service was heavily subsidized to the West Coast. And that was because of the West Coast interests that wanted to keep postal rates low to, do, to deliver mail out to the West Coast. So it was something that was debated. Um, and, and it's also, I mean, it's apparent when you look at the Confederate Constitution that people in the Confederate states recognized that there was a lot of special interest expenditures that they wanted to put an end to. Uh, and that was sort of recognized, too, in the northern states. There was a, uh, an editorial in, um, I think I got the paper right, the New York World, uh, which was a New York newspaper, obviously, um, where uh, uh, during the war between the states, they were saying, uh, uh, actually, when this war is over, we ought to look at the Confederate Constitution because it's got a lot of good things in it that we might do well to, to adopt. Uh, so I think, you know, the short answer to your question is yes, special interests have been with us in politics ever since the beginning. It was mostly at the local level up until you get into the 20th century because that's where the money is. And I think the bigger government is, the more you're going to have that, that, that special interest uh, activity. Uh, and it's... Um, you know, these days, I guess a buzzword that we hear about in the news a lot is crony capitalism. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's, it's a real exists. And, uh, you know, so you look at the, uh, the Occupy Wall Street type people, I think that's a legitimate people. But I think the solution that a lot of them suggest
suggest it back. The reason that you have that type of activity is because government is big. They're saying, oh, we need bigger government to oversee um, you know, our capitalist system. But no, when government grows, that opens the opportunity for more cronyism. So really the solution to that is smaller government. Uh, during the problems in 1913, why they did an income tax, how would you have changed uh, the income tax allowance, or how would you change it today? Are you asking how I would change the, the 16th Amendment? Yeah. Um, That's more I don't know. Yeah, huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you go back to the history of the, of the 16th Amendment, uh, it, it was partly well, that would not even say small part, um, a regional issue, north versus south. That the southern states had long thought that the tax system discriminated against them because the Constitution specifies that you can, uh, you can put a tariff on imports but no tariff on exports. And the southern states felt like we're importing a lot of manufactured goods. We're sending raw materials up to northern manufacturers who then can export what we're producing without paying a tariff. So the southern states felt that the system of federal revenues was working against them. Uh, and when the income tax was, uh, was passed, it was originally passed. Um, but it actually doesn't have to do with the amendment because that's the enabling legislation. Uh, but, but there was a definitely a regional interest there. And that's, well, and when the income tax was passed, just an interesting little factoid on that is that uh, there was a generous standard deduction in the income tax. And it wasn't until World War II that the typical working person would earn enough income to pay income tax. So if you just had a factory job or an office job or something, you wouldn't be paying income tax because the standard deduction was so high. Up until World War II is, is when that changed. Um, and the maximum rate, it was a progressive tax from the beginning, the maximum rate was 7% when it was instituted. And just an interesting little factoid, uh, in the first year that the income tax was collected, more income tax was paid by the residents of the city of Chicago than by all of the residents in all of the former Confederate states combined. Uh, so it was, you know, it was a, a tax that was aimed at uh, at the rich, and uh, I think I guess President that would resonate with President Obama, who wants the rich to pay their fair share. Most people didn't pay any, uh, and uh, you know, the tax was almost entirely paid by uh, by upper income people. Of course, the top rate was seven percent when it was originally passed, and it's gone up. Good question. Yeah. This is the fact that the founders had a fallback if the electric 